Good evening here in New York, Kombanwa in London, and Ohio Gozaimasu to all of you in Japan. All three locations that we have for tonight's special program on uh, sustainable foods, a multi nine mindset. My name is Joshua Walker. I'm here at Japan Society. I'm excited about tonight's uh, discussion, not only because I want to talk about anything else besides the election that's been raging the last week in the US, but I think that today's topic is something that is, is, is particularly important for the conversation about food culture and understanding a mindset that uh, permeates one of Japan's uh, soft power assets. So let me thank tonight's major sponsor, Mitsukan Holdings Company, who you'll get a chance to hear a lot about today uh, and is sponsoring the program, along with our Talks Plus season sponsors, MUFG. Financial Group, as well as an anonymous donor and the Sandy Heck Lecture Fund and Laurel Gonzalez. You're going to have an opportunity to hear from some amazing uh, speakers and also experts tonight on the sustainability and the idea of what multi nine mindset means. First, we'll hear from Ms. Seiko Nakano, who's joining us as the executive director and member of the board at Mizukan Holdings, a Japanese food company. It's based in Aichi Prefecture, which is focused on reducing waste and environmental strain. So thank you, Seiko-san, for joining us. Then we'll be hearing from uh, Paul Bello, the CEO of Zen B, a plant-based food company, which derives its name from a Japanese word, Zenbu, meaning whole, followed by a panel discussion with Brian Kateman, a co-founder and president of the Reductionarian Foundation, a nonprofit organization dedicated to reducing consumption of meat, eggs, and dairy to create a healthy, sustainable, and compassionate world. Finally, there will be a cooking demonstration featuring Zen B products, so you don't want to miss that. The topic uh, tonight is the Japanese concept of motainai, which anybody who grows up in Japan hears this many times from their mother saying it's motainai to do this or motainai to do that, which conveys a sense of deep regret over something being wasted. And it's more important now than ever, especially as we're all stuck at home during this pandemic, to be mindful of the things that we're wasting. It's about natural resources that are becoming strained, and there's a need to find innovative solutions to, to reduce food waste. And that's exactly the topic for tonight, and specifically looking at Japanese food companies and companies around the world that are embracing this multi-nine mindset to use every last part of the food and think about building a more sustainable future. So with that, please join me in welcoming uh, Ms. Nakano. Seiko-san, let me turn it over to you and say thank you again for joining us from such a late time in London. Hello everyone, my name is Seiko Nakano. Thank you for joining today. I would also like to thank you the Japan Society and Sekiya-san. Today, I would like to share Ms. Khan history. Let's start in 1804. Back then, Tokyo was called Edo. A city of 1 million people, fewer people could eat food from every part of Japan. A man named Matazaemo owned a sake brewery in Aichi. He made a 350 kilometer journey to Edo. In Edo, he saw delicious food stores, soba, sushi, tempura. Matazaemo tried sushi for the first time. It was more than double size of today's sushi and made using rice vinegar. Matazaimo spotted a chance. He had been making a new vinegar from sake leaves. Sake leaves are a natural byproduct from sake brewing, like beer drinks. Sake leaves vinegar was cheaper than rice vinegar. Sushi could be more reasonable and even more delicious. Back in Aji, there were many sake breweries. They were shipping routes to other prefectures. So sake leaves were widely available. Matazaimon began using the sake leaves picture here on the right, this one, to make vinegar on a large scale. It had never been done before. Brewer didn't want to contaminate sake with vinegar, but it was a success. Matazaimo established a vinegar brewery. 
Matazamo wanted to use a sake leaves. He had a motainai mindset. Motainai is often translated as what a waste. Regret for something that still has value. Motainai is about reduce, recycle, reuse. It also adds a force of respect. This comes from a Shinto belief. Objects have souls and should not be thrown away. As a side note, how is vinegar made? Vinegar is made by fermental alcohol. Any alcohol can be used, wine, champagne, beer, cider. It's interesting to look at Japanese character for vinegar. It looks a combination of two characters. One is alcohol, the other is to make. With sake leaks vinegar, Matazaimo targeted the Edo market. The sweetness of sake leaves went well with sushi. It was better better than rice vinegar. His vinegar was used in sushi across Edo and helped spread sushi across the country. Over the year, his business became Miskan, the top vinegar company in Japan. Of course, the world is very different now. Miskan operates not just in Japan, but in the US and the UK. In 2018, we released the Miskan vision statement. Our vision is to unify case experience and health choice while reducing our impact on the environment. For example, Lagu is one of our brands. Lagu has an authentic taste without artificial flavors or colors. Our new brand is Zenbi. Zenbi products are vegetable snacks that use as much of the whole vegetable as possible. This helps reduce food waste. I hope you enjoy Matazamon's story. Thank you. Thank you, Seiko-san. Uh, welcome to everyone. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Dr. Walker and Japan Society for putting on such a unique event. Uh, I just want to correct Dr. Walker. I am not the CEO. There is, there's only one CEO of MISCAN, so I am the uh, COO of Zenbi US in the UK. And I'd like to kind of walk you through um, a number of different charts to talk about a brand we're all very proud of. Just bear with me. It doesn't seem to be forwarding very well. Can you change the slide forward? It doesn't seem to be moving. Can anyone hear that? Ah, thank you. Sorry about that. So our brand is a very early stage brand, very new in its infancy. Uh, Zembi is a brand driven that's uh, committed to making a healthier, tastier, and more sustainable world. This was a vision of the owner and the founder of this project, Mr. Nakano. Uh, we're about making plant-powered products that can inspire change. So it's not about just creating a brand that will benefit MISCAN. The idea is that we would benefit, improve the way the world eats and the availability of healthier foods that stand for something. Our name, as Dr. Walker said, uh, is a derivative of Zembu, a Japanese term meaning all 
entire, all together. And that can take a lot of different meanings. Um, I believe it's important that we not only bring together the family to the dinner table again, I think that's the vision that we have is to create an opportunity for the family to spend more time together and to enjoy healthier meal operations, uh, opportunities than they've been. I think it's also important that we try to create change in the behaviors of the world's population. So hopefully as we created uh, Zembi and we start to create a much bigger portfolio, it's gonna inspire change in the way the world consumes their food, the way the world consumes vegetables in a responsible way. So why Zembi? So I said it's a, a little over four years uh, that the brand was created. The project was created leading to the launch of Zembi about a year and a half ago in the U.S. and about two years ago in Japan and just six months ago in the U.K. So what is the challenge and the vision for the brand? So we talked about using innovation and unique ways to create technology, food technologies, to respond to this new era. And the new era will change just, the, just by the people and the consumers and the demographics that will consume our products. The world population continues to grow. Unprecedented environmental issues that we will be dealing with. The, the population, the millennials and Gen X will require the brands that they interact with and they consume to be uh, accountable, to be responsible for the impact on society and the impact of the, of the earth. And then the other aspect of it is to make sure that we're taking uh, great tasting, healthy foods and we're bringing it together in a way that consumers find it convenient, the consumers find it very healthy, but also can try and change the behaviors that have been made up over many years. So technology-driven change in food. So we have a brand statement. This is a pretty lengthy one, so I won't read it to you. But it talks about the responsibility that we have as a brand MizCan as a company on making sure that we are a responsible brand, uh, that we have everything that we need in, in society and from the earth to do the right thing. And we aim to do just that, change the way we think about food, help uh, place food in both a wholesome and delicious center. And that's sometimes where the challenge is. Many companies want to be healthier. We want to be healthier. We also want to make sure we're providing great tasting foods to consumers. So the three pillars um, is obviously talking about, and these are the, this is how we talk to really all external partnerships. Anyone that interacts with our brand, anyone who interacts with our team, we talk about it through these three pillars. Um, the world's full of delicious foods, but we often take them for granted. Bringing out the true taste of the vegetable is critically important in whatever we innovate. And I'll talk a little about that in a second. We wanna make sure we, you are what you eat. So more and more as people, especially during this pandemic and what the world is going through, are becoming much more conscious of what they put in their body. They understand a lot is in their control in terms of managing and protecting their own health and also their family's health. And then the last piece of it is, you know, you're seeing it everywhere. I think the challenges are for those who are denying it or probably not seeing it through the right lens, but it has to be about harnessing the goodness of nature and being responsible what we take from nature and what we give back. And for us, as you're gonna see in the products, uh, hopefully that you've gotten a chance to taste, is that we're trying to use as much of the vegetable as possible. Uh, we wanna make sure that we're still providing a very great tasting product, but we wanna make sure that we can talk about the footprint the product has and making sure that we're not adding to the major waste issue globally. So this is the current lineup. Uh, we have uh, our first product that we launched was Veggie Sticks, and it comes in, a, in a five great varieties, all meant to be able to provide great taste, to great, create great health, and making sure that people can use it within their current lifestyle. The other was Veggie Bites, Vegetable Bites. You know, it uses more of the whole vegetables. We can say that it basically provides consumers one full cup of veggies in every pouch that we serve, which is really an important claim to be able to make. And then it's a blended of a combination of fruits and spices with the vegetables. So hopefully you get a chance to taste it. So a quick glimpse of what we're planning to do very, very shortly, uh, quite honestly, uh, next week here in the US, it's already been done in Japan, is we're launching one of the first plant-based pastas made from 100% yellow pea. 
And while you, yellow pea is not necessarily an ingredient that has just been created, it's been an ingredient that's been around a long time. What we've tried to do is harness the power of this unique ingredient, make sure that we can provide it to consumers. We continue to use as our policy as much of the legume as possible. So in this case, we use the skin, including the yellow pea. Um, and you're gonna see very soon, especially in the US and already in Japan, that the yellow pea has great characteristics. It's very healthy. Uh, it's a great part of source of protein and fiber, uh, iron and potassium. What's unique about this legume is it really is a very delicious, very delicious uh, culinary history going way back. Uh, originally in the Middle East, peas spread throughout the Mediterranean region and has become bigger and bigger in the Middle East and also in the US and Asia. And I think we have a very unique positioning in using this product with our current launches. You will see that we're gonna turn it into pasta, literally in the US as of next week. Hopefully you can go on our website at zenvi.com and try the many products, but especially our pastas. Uh, but you can see if you, if you compare Zenvi pasta versus traditional pasta, protein, fiber, and the net carbs are obviously very, very beneficial to the current diet plans. And we'll be providing great recipes, exciting new recipes and delicious recipes on how to do this product. So that's a little bit about what Zenbi is. We're very passionate about it. I think there is a very consistent global vision of what we want in the brand DNA. I think it's very clear from our leader, Mr. Nakano, to make sure that globally, wherever you see the brand name, there's a consistency as a consumer of what you should expect. Okay, and that's what we're working on very aggressively. So with that, uh, I'll stop and I'll turn it over to Brian. Thank you, Ms. Nakano and Mr. Bello for those wonderful presentations. And thank you all to who's joining us for this virtual program. I'm Tomomi Sekiya, Director of the Talks Plus program at Japan Society. We'll now move on to a panel discussion moderated by Brian Cateman, co-founder and the president of the Reducitarium Foundation. Mr. Cateman, please go ahead. Excellent. Well, thank you so much to the organizers for having me. And thank you so much to Paul and Seiko for those illuminating remarks. Um, I'm so excited for this discussion. And I just want to just a, a couple of minutes kind of explain why I'm, I'm so excited. You know, about 10 years ago, I remember being a, a student in college and I was that guy on campus who was very excited about environmental issues. I was recycling. I was composting. I was bringing my you know, refillable bottle um, to school. I was even walking or riding a bike instead of driving. And at some point in college, later in college, I recognized that food was an issue that really wasn't discussed all that much. Um, someone gave me a book, um, The Ethics of What We Eat. And that was a light bulb moment for me. And you know, I remember about a decade ago, not knowing a ton of people who were specialized in, in thinking uh, about the relationship between climate change and biodiversity loss and deforestation and natural resource depletion and food and what we put in our body and how it impacts our health. And what I have found in, in, in the recent years is that this is incredible innovation and enthusiasm around developing products that are not only beneficial to our planet, but are beneficial to people. And the reality is that most people simply do not eat enough fruits and vegetables. And there's all sorts of complicated reasons why that is. But I am so exciting, excited because I think we are at a tipping point. And I think that is in part due to the innovations um, that we're seeing from, from companies like the, the ones that we just heard from. So I'd love to open the, the panel discussion. And you know, obviously we're in a really unique time COVID-19 has impacted um, the world at lot, large in a multitude of ways, um, but it's also impacted the food system and how people um, are making decisions around food. So I'm wondering, you know, for both Seiko and Paul, um, with COVID having a, a massive impact on eating behaviors, what do you see as the current sort of new normal uh, for food and, and diets? はい、え、コロナの食生活への影響についての質問になります。最近の食品や食事に関するニューノーマルとは何でしょうか? 
三つほど私の方では感じています。一つ目は植物由来の食品への関心というものがあります。あの皆さんもあの多分あると思うんですけれども、コロナによって健康への意識が高まっていまして、そこに対して免疫を高める可能性のある植物性の商品への関心が高まっています。でそのために今まであの植物性の大,大,業に大買い肉というものが売り上げが倍増していましてあのこちらの方が非常に関心が上がっているというふうな実態があるというふうに見ています。Yeah, I think there are three key changes. One of them is an interest in plant based foods. And actually, one of the big trends that you might also be feeling right now is an acceleration in consumer interest in plant based products. According to one study, sales of plant based meat alternatives have doubled every month this year in the United States. 2つ目に外食ではなく家で料理をすることということでこちらの方はあのアメリカだけではなく日本あとロンドンイギリスにおいてはロックダウンもあった影響で非常にこの機会が増えています特に皆さんあの記憶にあると思うんですけれどもパンを作ることで小麦の売り上げも上がっていますしまた日本だと家族で食卓を囲むということで鍋やお寿司っていったものに The second is an increase in cooking more at home instead of going out. With more and more people working from home, offices will never be the same again as they used to be. And with the recent lockdown in London, this is also decreasing the opportunities for eating outside. And as a result, there's more time to cook at home. And in Japan in particular, there's been an increase in things such as nabe and sushi made at home. あと3つ目にネット販売や宅配が増えていますで。こちらの方はやはりロックダウンの影響で人混みを避けるためにオンラインに切り替える方々が増えています。ブレックミートクリックの調査によると2019年度のオンラインショッピングは食料品の売り上げの全体の約 3% の12億ドルぐらいでしたが2020年の6月ぐらいでは全国のオンライン食料品の販売は72億ドルに達したそうですしまたここロンドンでもオンラインの売り上げが増えており年配の方々も利用して利用し始めた実態もあります。And the third is an increase in online shopping and home delivery. According to a study by Brick Meets Brick, in 2019, online shopping increased、uh, by 3% uh, to 7.2 million dollars. So, Seiko's take is right, it's, it's more cooking at home, more acceptance around plant based alternatives, and uh, uh, ordering online more groceries delivery.、Um, what's your take, Paul, on the, the, new, the new normal, the new culture we're seeing, people's relationship to food? Yeah, I would agree with all the points that Seiko san made. And I also think it, it really puts Zenbi in a very unique position to capture this opportunity, which we believe is long term, this trend. The, the change behaviors we believe are permanent. This is not a fad or a trend. We believe it will change the way consumers、uh, see food, see the planning for their meals.、Um, and, th- and the only thing I'd add to it is, is as people used to have to make decisions around eating out and then weighing the cost of that and the healthiness of that, I think looking at products that deliver something meaningful. Uh, like a Zembi in terms of the dosage of vegetables, or like a future yellow pea product that will provide you know, a healthy alternative, a tasteful, healthy alternative. I don't think it's as stark of a contrast of, of price anymore because people were making decisions in the past with the mindset, this is the best I can do with the time I have. Now, with them working from home more often, we believe that will open up more the opportunity for them to engage with different brands and not all through one. Particular、uh, network like an Amazon or a retailer website. We believe coming directly to the manufacturer will hopefully become more of a trend going forward. That's great. That makes a lot of sense to me. And so, Paul, how has、um, COVID changed your business strategy? I mean, it must impact you know, so many parts of everything from product development to distribution.、Um, I'd、yeah. love to hear more about what you're thinking there. Yeah, so you know, quite honestly,、um, 
where we had some people in the early stages, because this was a big stretch moving from a conventional brand that didn't have as many uh, hurdles that had to be cleared around the DNA of the product. There were very high standards of our ingredients, very high standards from our suppliers, from our manufacturers and so on. And we thought in the beginning, some of them might be too high to clear uh, to create a consistent and a profitable business. Uh, COVID quite honestly has reinforced the most important thing about eating, things about eating. And so it allowed us, the, the suppliers that we were already talking to about buying the ingredients, the very unique, very expensive ingredients to make our products, um, we were able to work with them very closely to make sure that all of those things were consistent to what the consumer was looking for during this COVID period. And once again, we think the trends are a longer term. So it really has not changed much of our strategy, Brian. Um, I believe going forward, what we're going to try to do is not look at uh, the opportunity around the product, but we're looking and working very aggressively. If anything, we're looking to work even more aggressively and quicker on building a product pipeline that can fill more consumer needs. Now we call it our staple food strategy. Um, and that means we want to make sure that we have Zambi creating products where, where um, they're used on a regular basis. We call it a 365, six, 365 days a year, six times a day during those eating opportunities, the two snacks in between, that Zembi will have products available. So if anything changed, that's what's changed for us on the short term. How do we accelerate the innovation pipeline? And, and before we move on to the next topic, Paul, I, there was a slide that you had uh, about the kind of target audience and segment that you're looking for. Obviously, yeah. someone who's, who's very excited about a world in which people consume fewer animal products and more plant yeah, yeah. products. And as a millennial, maybe I'm biased, I have this yeah. idea in my mind that, that the millennials and the Gen Z are yeah. driving this, this trend. Do you think that's accurate, that those are the people that are I'm excited about consuming more plant-based foods, or am I underestimating how many no. different um, you know, target audiences this might even touch upon? I, I, do, I do believe you're right, Brian. Uh, we are counting on the millennial generation, the Gen Z uh, demographic, to be an aspirational demographic that others will want to follow. But it's interesting, in the beginning, when we started to talk to consumers about the brand positioning, about the products, we got a really aggressive pushback from older consumers who said, you know, we, we believe just as strongly as the young people that we can live a better life by being really careful about our health and eating the right things. So, but it all starts in one place. Our, our thinking around marketing says, let's get the aspirational generation and demographic to really get behind the product, talk about the product in the way that older consumers have not really engaged with yet. But make it an aspirational brand to say that you too, at any demographic, uh, can eat better can eat tasteful things that are healthy, uh, that stand for something. So it's yes, we do have a target demographic. And yes, you are the target demographic, Brian, without a doubt. But to be quite honest, it's not, it's not enough to only be successful with your target demographic. For us to make meaningful change, we have to really touch the entire population. It doesn't happen overnight. It's a very early stage brand. But our goal is over time to continue to expand the portfolio and the messaging to most of the population, if not all of it. Well, I, I will do my best of, on behalf of the generation. <laughs> but, I, but I really do, um, what you're saying resonates with me quite a lot on a personal note. And I we will not talk about politics tonight, but I will tell you that after, even after doing this work for so long, it's only been recently that my dad, for example, has kind of come on board. And it's not necessarily around climate change or sustainability, sustainability yeah. issues, which we'll talk about. But for him, it's about his health because you know, he's in his late 60s. He loves me and my family and wants to be on the planet for a longer time and understands that there is something to the very simple idea that consuming um, foods that are better for you does have a direct link between issues like you know, heart disease and cancer and diabetes and obesity and so on. So um, I very much am uh, also excited about the idea that it's not just, um, you know, my generation, but uh, older ones too, that, that perhaps would, um, you know, would, didn't necessarily have the advantages that my generation did. You know, my parents did the best they could, but I grew up drinking a lot of soda. I grew up drinking a lot of cocoa puffs. I grew up drinking, you know, eating a lot of um, highly processed foods, not a lot of fruits and vegetables. And so, um, yeah, I, I, I totally get what you're saying. I, I would only add to that, Brian, that you got to think about the generation, which I'm a part of. I'm not the one. I wish I was a part of your generation. It's also about information. 
which is a big part of the way we communicate with our consumers and the way we structured our website. We want to provide a place that they can come together and learn. So we want to make sure we have content on the website that allows people while they're looking for great products to buy, but they're also learning. They have much more information today than my generation did or the generation before that. That, that definitely makes sense. All right. Well, together we'll tackle all the whole world, all the people <laughs> on the planet. Good. Um, this is for this question is for both both of you, um, Seiko and Paul. Um, you know, I I'm um, I'm always just um, very excited about companies that are on the forefront of working on these issues. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the history, um, you know, of the company. Have you has this always been a, a priority thinking about health and nutrition? Um, and as it becomes um, an even greater priority. Um, how is your company, um, you know, reformulating its, its products to meet that demand? もともと弊社は先ほどご紹介させていただいた通り、食数を中心にして、あの、やってきた企業となっていますが、食数だけではなくて、やはり日本の食文化ということを考えたときに、お客様のことを考えてどういった食品がいいのかということで、例えばあの
You know, you know, Brian, I would say my initial concerns as we were, it was a project that created a branded business. My initial concern was, would the name Zenbi or derivative of Zenbu, meaning whole altogether, would that be difficult for an American consumer or British consumer in particular to really embrace? And the research that we did was very clear that very positive attributes, when they felt it was a Japanese eating style or a Japanese-based brand, it was very, very well received, got very strong remarks because the, the thought from most American consumers that we tested it with was that this must be high quality, this must be healthy. And those were their words, not ours. These are not the questions that we created. When we asked them to describe what they thought of when, they, when we described the products that we were going to create or we described the brand vision, their response was very positive because they see the Japanese eating behavior, um, style, uh, being very positive. Now, they don't necessarily uh, all engage with it, but it was interesting from the research we did how positive it was. And that's one of the reasons we wanted Zenbi, again, to be called the same thing and represent the same thing globally. Because as we do research around and in the UK as well, the very same thing is true. That's really interesting. That's really interesting. Yeah, I, I imagine that makes sense. You know, um, I hate to say it, but when I think of American food, I think of fast food. I think of uh, the McDonald's and the KFCs and the Burger Kings. And so um, I could, I, I can understand, I suppose, the association with, um, and of course the meaning, I mean, Whole Foods is so popular, right? Or Whole Foods, not just the, the, <laughs> the institution, but the concept. So um, I, can, I can understand why it's translating well. Um, I want to pick up on something um, you mentioned earlier, Paul, which is, you know, you said, which is a fair point, right, that information and education is an essential component that people need to understand the issues and they need to, you know, be educated, not just on the fancy words like upcycled and you know, environmental sustainability and so on, but just the experience of, of you know, even eating vegetables and, and in this way. Um, but at the end of the day, I would imagine you might agree that if it tastes bad, it's not gonna win, right? Taste is, is king, it has to taste good. And to some extent, price and convenience is, is certainly going to play a factor in any sure. consumer's decision. So, um, you know, I wonder if you could just speak to that and, and, and then and Seiko as well about that reality, the importance of um, taste, how it is that you went about deciding on particular, you know, flavors um, to, to your, your products. Um, and how are you adapting those local freight flavor preferences to um, achieve a deliciousness in, in your product? Seiko San, would you like to start? Thank you. Yes, yes. Motomoto, Hesha, and Nakade, and Mirai Vision Sengi, and Nakade, Sekai, Tabaniki, Chiki, the Kaste, Osa Hiragiru Governor, so she sees Koto, Okorate, Shohin Kahato, Sta, Eto, Yatikimasta, De, Shokua, Sunokuni Munikoto, Nibunka, Aruto, Moimas, no de, Sunokuni, Oker, Sekatsha, no, Iken, or Daisin, Ste, Sukoni, Oker, Shiko, Seo, Kitinto, Trae, Snowede, whatever no group, then Tide, no Giz, and no how, or Ikaste, Sono, Iji, Taste, de Atari, Matawa, Shoka, Mita, and Mono, uh, we are developing and renewing our products based on our future vision statement, which is build meets gang corporate governments to bring the world together, implement with local style and make the world taste delicious. So food is an integral part of any country's culture and we're striving to develop products that utilize that technology and the know-how of the overall group company while also respecting the local culture and history and taste and texture that each region has. Yeah, I think, I think that's exactly what we're trying to accomplish in each of the geographies. And we're hoping those geographies expand aggressively over the next several years. But specifically in the US and the UK, what we've tried to do is look at the requirements, the local taste requirements for someone to taste our products and to tell us that it's a delicious product. Because you're exactly right, Brian, without that is not a sustainable business and it's not a sustainable brand. So we keep that first and foremost in all the geographies, the product has to taste good, right? The second piece is what we've done, especially with the upcoming launch of, of the yellow pea pasta, is that we've tried to create right up front, not after the launch, 
very quick ideas for recipes, which provide a very quick meal solution for consumers to prepare a meal, to plan a meal, whether it be the things they have to buy as part of their shopping list or the things that are already in their refrigerator that they can quickly put together. The common denominator would be a very healthy center of that meal, like yellow pea pasta, that you can cater to your own local taste preferences. We're also going to expand to a line of sauces and other types of products, which will hopefully, what we call value is what you described earlier, you know, the price, the taste, and so on. We have to create real value. For it to be a sustainable proposition, someone says, hey, this product, although it's a premium product, is less than if I went out for a meal. It's, it's more healthy than if I went out for a meal. And I can do it, even though I'm not a great cook. I'm not a culinary expert, right? They take away the fear from it by giving them really easy ways to prepare our products. That is an absolute goal in all three of the geographies and what we're trying to accomplish. And that certainly relates very well to uh, what Seiko had said at the, at the top of the discussion, this trend toward people cooking, you know, cooking more at home. It is remarkable. I don't know what your experience yeah. is like, but the amount of just money that I've realized I spent going out to eat compared yeah. to getting any ingredient on the shelf and cooking it at home um, is truly remarkable. So it is, it is very exciting that, that I imagine there are some consumers out there that um, you know, have now uh, uh, shifted their, how they spend their time and, and their, their resources um, you know, my, the favorite, my favorite thing so far about this, these presentations, and you might have to help me out, um, Paul and or Seiko, is that that, that word, um, I'm not gonna be able to pronounce it, Matani, can you help me there? <laughs> I think she's going to have to help you with that. Yeah, Seiko, what is that? <laughs> I, I remember being regret. Yeah. That's right. That's right. That's a, a fascinating concept to me. And I'm, Bear, and I won't try to repeat it, but I'm very curious to know more about it and how Zenbi is, is trying to tackle food waste and how it intersects with that, that new concept um, that I've just learned. And I think that question is, is for you, Paul, if I'm not mistaken. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. So I was, I was thinking because of the pronunciation that Seiko-san would start. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, she, did a, she did a great job helping us out. Yeah. yeah, I mean, listen, it's a basic concept, I think, anywhere you are in the world about having a feeling of guilt if there's waste, right? Um, I think if you look at the, the significant challenge we have in the U.S. and all over the world around waste, and particularly food waste, you hear a lot of uh, sound bites of what companies are thinking of doing. Um, you have a lot of sound bites of saying it's a priority or building it into mission statements and so on. I think the way we're going about it is saying that it's on a small way because we are a small business, but if we do things that are right, if we're adding value to the consumer and we stand for something important that they feel is very important for future generations, then they will support us as a brand and they will support us as a business. But whether you call it that, which obviously is a Japanese term, or you know, growing up in Brooklyn, New York, like I did, it was a couple of very clear messages. If you opened a package or if you took something out of the refrigerator, you needed to finish it, right? Not waste it, right? Or they used to have the common, another Italian thing was, sometimes your eyes are bigger than your mouth, right? I'm sure somebody has heard that one before. But I just think it's a responsible, something that we have to live as not just a, a company that creates products, we have to live that messaging. We have to live those values. And that's quite honestly, in working with the, the owner of this business and the leader of this business, there is no discussions around shortcuts in this area. All right, so we started with snacks. We're moving to yellow pea, which obviously uses much less of the earth's resources. It's a very smart crop. And everything that we consider down the road as we expand the pipeline will have to go through that lens. It has to have that responsible lens uh, going forward. So that, that would be my input to it. And so, yeah, let's talk about the, the product themselves. So I have, I have one here. And I'm going to grab <laughs> the other one that's, that's fallen here. And I, you know, I want to talk about the product. So. What exactly I, I, did you it? pay full price? Did you pay? I, I, I think so. Up? Maybe, maybe double. Um, okay. <laughs> um, uh, yeah. What, you know, what's in them the ingredients wise, how did you go about sourcing them? How did you go about developing them from a, you know, um, just a, a research and development perspective? I'd, I'd love to know more about that. Oh, you're, you're muted, Paul. Join us. So I can, I, I can, let's, let's start with how the product concepts were created. We felt 
we did a lot of research and there are a lot of fertile areas around foods that we below, believe this particular brand uh, would be very successful. We started in snacks because we felt it was an opportunity, especially in the US, but in, even in, uh, in Japan, um, we felt it was an opportunity to get people to immediately dive in outside of a regular meal to try what the brand stands for. We started with a, the stick product, which is very portable on the go. We sought out very unique suppliers. People, by the way, less than 5% of the crop is made whole, is left whole. As you talked about corn a little earlier, prior to us getting started, uh, corn, 95% of it comes it being off of the cob. So we wanted to find the suppliers of organic corn where we could use the cob. Less than 5% of it was available on the cob in the US. So there were very unique challenges in trying to pull together the initial product of sticks and delivering against our guiding principles, our standards. We then launched into uh, the bites, a more portable form of the snack. And we said this would have to be a little bit more of a, a blending of fruits and spices, a little bit more of a culinary experience. And again, all within the learning, all within the guidelines that we created within Zembi, but a unique uh, uh, situation where we blended it to ensure that we were delivering against the claim of one full cup of vegetables and fruits. So as you can imagine, we had a lot of trial and error in the product development. And doing product development globally is not easy uh, because you're coordinating in different time zones, different locations. But we have the benefit of MISCAN, Brian, that has uh, a presence and has a reputation globally that we had people going to farms in Germany, in the UK, in the US, in California, obviously, we would spend a lot of time if you think about where a lot of organic products, uh, ingredients are grown. So that's been one of the, the most interesting aspects of the beginning of our journey, because it's just the beginning. But we've tried to make sure we're blending to deliver the combination of what you said, which is so difficult sometimes. It's the combination of taste and healthiness within the standards of Zembi. Well, that's, that makes sense. And it's good that you're at least thinking about those various trade-offs so that you can um, you know, design a, a product and experience that's also ultimately successful in the marketplace. Um, you know, on that front, and this is a question for both both you and uh, and Seiko. Um, it's funny, right? Because there's this amazing trend where a lot of people are excited to think about what they put in their body. They want healthier. They want more environmentally sustainable. And that, in in essence, is a big, I imagine, a big you know part of your target audience. And then on the other hand, if you go just a little bit more, make it a little bit more intense, you have some people that are not going to be excited about sort of the processed food category, right? So these are the people that will say, you gotta eat apples. If it didn't come straight from the ground, it's not a product that I wanna put in my body. So I wonder, you know, for both you and, and Seiko, um, how it is that you think about processed food um, and, and what your thoughts are on it, uh, broadly speaking, and maybe Seiko can start.難しい質問なんですけれども、あの、すべての加工食品が悪いというわけではないですし、やはり加工食品が生まれてきた背景には何かそこに理由や価値があると思います。けど、そこその加工食品がその企業の利益のみを優先してお客様の健康であったり環境
、えっと、次の世代にこの地球を渡していくためにこれどういう商品であるべきか例えば持続可能性のある容器とか包装とはどういうものなのかとかフードロスはどうしたらいいのかまたは地球,あの地球だけではなくて地域社会ということも考えなきゃいけないのでこうしたことを常に考えて商品開発をしていくことが大事だというふうに思っています。We have a slogan called, called Bringing Flavor, and it addresses our intention of、uh, it's not just about the food that you put in your body, but also the lives of the food, the life of the food that you're taking in order to do the production. So, we're always thinking about how to support the lives, that lives and livelihood of our users and what they don't want to put in their bodies versus what they do. And the,、uh, the general structure of what it means to, to produce sustainable foods. We're always thinking about that. The Mirai Vision Sengen to Ste, Ima, Yarrow to Ste, Koto to Ste, Clean Label, No Tolikumi, or Saste, Itadai Temas, the Korea, I know. 商品のラベルにお客様がよくわからないものをあの使わないようにまた取りたくないものは使わない減らしたいものを極力つあの使わないようにしておこうということを考えて取り組みをさせていただいていますで具体的に実際に今ラグーのシンプルソースというものを発売させていただいてこちらの方をあまり好まれない砂糖とか大豆油といったものを減らして、まあ、野菜の甘みをうまく利用してあの味にちゃんとフルあのボディ感を持たせてオリーブオイルを使うことで美味しさとか健康とかそうしたことお客さんのことを考えて作った商品を出させていただきます。An example of an initiative that we've been working on that addresses these questions that we think about of what's environmentally friendly and what,、uh, what the community needs from us is our clean label initiative for raw ingredients. So, this is still an initiative that's in the early stages, but we are gaining support from our customers. And、uh, the concept is basically first, we display the ingredients that everyone can understand. And secondly, that we don't use ingredients that customers don't want to consume. And we, we reduce as much as possible the ingredients that、uh, customers want to reduce their consumption of. Specifically, the Ragu Simply line. Uh, we developed is, a, is the pasta sauce that uses olive oil instead of、uh, other ingredients that are not favored by customers, which utilizes the sweetness of the vegetable、uh, and avoids sugar and soybean oil.、Uh, so, this sauce has been developed not only with this taste in, in mind, but also what the customers want and what their perspective is. Yeah, Brian, the only thing I would add to that is we, we've really started to learn more and more as we've launched this brand、um, in the US, especially over the last six months in the UK. That if you work closely and you communicate very transparently with consumers, like the traceability, where do our ingredients come from? How are they managed?、Uh, what impacts do they have? These are the kind of things that we want to gauge in a community building way.、Uh, right now, I would say revenue isn't the most important thing. And driving necessarily trials, building a community is probably the most important aspect of our strategy right now. And we want to build it through, as、uh, Seiko san said, with a very clean label, very simple to understand, making sure that it's consistent to our values. But at the same time, we want to talk, we want to have a bigger discussion because that'll tell us where to go next、uh, with consumers. I, I don't think, as Seiko san said, all processed foods are bad.、Um, and I also think the, the thing that we've learned. Uh, and the types of research, and we spent a tremendous amount, probably much, much more than any company of its size in consumer research, is that what consumers tell you in a survey and what, what action they take can many times be different. So we really want to get to the consumer behavior understanding what's really important to the consumer, how best should we communicate it on pack in the claims that we make and the products that we make. And that's,、uh, hopefully, that's what will enable a much bigger community. My thought is right now at this stage, we're not very influential, but with building scale in a consistent way and building it with the right vision and values, we can be very influential in the future. Well, what you, what you may lack in influence, you have an abundance of humility, which is, which is a good thing in saying that.、Um, you know, for me, the, the saying perfection is the enemy of the good comes to mind, you know, and I agree that not all processed food is equal. 
Um, but the reality is that there are a lot of consumers who are not lining up to have, uh, you know, buckets full of, of apples and, and carrots and beets in their original form. So I certainly think there's a, a role to play in shifting consumers who may not be eating the healthiest food to a, to a more, more healthy option. Yeah, no, we agree. We agree. Cool. Makes it easy for me. Well, you, we just have a minute left. Uh, I'd love to hear from, um, from both of you really about the, I suppose the future, you know, can we expect um, both of you to continue to champion plant-based foods, to invest in it, um, to consider exploring There's, I, I, you know, I learned about the, the pasta and the pea protein, which is very exciting. Um, can we, um, you know, continue to expect that you will um, head, head forward in that path? Maybe Seiko can start. あの、美味しさであったりとか人の健康、地球の健康に貢献できる商品をお客さんの声を聞きながら開発していくことと、先ほどお話しさせていただいた通り、やがて命に変わるものということを考えて、次の世代、命を続くということをサステナビリティと考
And you're gonna want them in pretty small pieces so they really get kneaded into the dough really well. This is a great step if you have some small hands that wanna participate and play along. Or if you're short on time, you can easily pop these into a small food processor and give them a couple pulses just to get to some small pieces. This is plain pizza dough, and the shortcut makes things really easy. You can buy pre-made pizza dough in the refrigerated section of the grocery store, which eliminates the need for having to make your own dough for this recipe. Pro tip, most pizza places will actually sell you their dough, so give your favorite place a call and give it a try. So we'll start by starching out the pizza dough, almost like you would a pizza. You can even let gravity help you out a little bit by just shaking it a little bit and, and picking up the edges and letting it stretch out. Just let it stretch out and maybe give it a little help. And then once it starts to stretch out a little bit, you're going to want to place it on a clean surface, just slightly dusted with flour. So I'm just gonna stretch it out a little bit more and then dust my surface with flour and then spread it out. And then you're going to want to sprinkle the Zen B veggie stick sprinkles all over. So once you've spread out the veggie stick pieces, you'll want to start at one end and start rolling up until you get into a long, a long roll and then you'll fold it over in half it's okay if there the little pieces start to fall out because then you're just going to start kneading the veggie stick pieces into the dough so you just want to keep kneading until the veggie stick pieces are are incorporated you might need a little extra flour on your cutting board just so it keeps from getting sticky. And then once you've fully incorporated the veggie sticks into your dough, you'll want to start rolling it into a log. And you're eventually gonna stretch that log into almost like a short rope of dough. That's about, oh, 10 inches long. Just keep rolling and stretching and it's okay if one or two pieces start to pop out a little bit, but you can see how that great marbly color looks in the dough. It looks really neat. It's gonna look really good once we're ready to cut it into crustini pieces. So as you can see, I think that's about good. And then you'll want to give it a little twist so you get kind of a marbled twist to it. And then you'll take a baking sheet it's been lined with parchment paper. Stretch it out across the baking sheet. And then, just so the bread keeps its shape while it's cooking, you'll wanna make four small shallow shell cuts just to make sure it keeps its shape. So just one, two, three, four really shallow cuts. It just helps keep it shape and make it look really good once it's out of the oven. So here we go, into the oven. And now for the roasted vegetables. Roasting brings out the best flavor of vegetables and it couldn't be easier. For perfect roast vegetables every time, follow our four simple steps. So step one is to sort your vegetables. Since different vegetables have different cook times, you wanna make sure to organize your vegetables into similar groups based on how long they take to roast. I'm going to put the quick cook cooking vegetables like mushrooms, cauliflower, Brussels sprouts, delicata squash together over here. Root vegetables like carrots and parsnips, and even sweet potatoes and onions take a little bit longer, so I'll put them over here. Step two is cutting the veggies. So everything that roasts together should be cut to about the same size. 
Since we're using our roast veggies as a topper for the costini, I'm cutting them into small cubes. First thing that I'm going to cut is the delicata squash. And what makes this veggie so special is you can actually eat the skin. First, I'm going to cut the delicata into thin strips like this. So just slice lengthwise into thin strips. And then I'm going to turn them to the side, line them up, and then just start chopping them into small little chunks, like so. Until they're all chopped into little pieces. For the Brussels sprouts, I like to trim off the bottom, like so, and then peel off the leaves like this. And that way they'll get really crispy as you roast them. Smaller pieces will roast much more quickly and will have more delicious caramelized ed edges when it's time to eat. Once you've cut up your vegetables, step three is to arrange and season them. First we'll Put the Brussels sprouts right next to the shallots. You want to group the vegetables together. So when vegetables are stacked like this, they tend to steam more than roast. So we don't want any overlapping on the baking sheet. So you'll want to spread them out like this. This ensures maximum contact to the pan when roasting so you can get more of those caramelized edges. After you spread out your different vegetables in their little groups, make sure that there's as much roasting space as possible, you'll want to season your vegetables. So first, start by drizzling everything with a little bit of olive oil. So I'm just gonna go, just drizzle. Next, you'll want to season with some salt. and then some black pepper. And finally, you'll want to add a sprinkle of some fresh herbs. I'm using sage leaves, but thyme and rosemary would also work really well with these vegetables. Step four is to roast the veggies in a hot preheated oven. Since these quick cooking veggies are cut so small, they'll only take about 20 minutes. Once the bread and veggies are baked and cooled, it's time to assemble the crostini. I'm going to slice into the bread that we baked earlier. And I'm gonna slice in half inch slices. So about this size. Wow, look at that color. That is so beautiful. Just gonna keep slicing until the whole loaf has been all sliced up. For each slice, spread some softened goat cheese. Just push down and spread it back like this. And top with some of our roasted vegetables. We've let the goat cheese soften just a little bit to come to room temperature to make it easier to spread. The goat cheese gives it a nice tang, while the Zenbi veggie sticks, stick crumbs give it a little bit of sweetness. The roasted veggies and herbs also give it a nice depth of flavor. So after we've topped all of our crostini, you'll want to put them on a plate so they look really nice. Don't these look great? It's perfect for entertaining. Well, thanks for joining us today, and I hope you enjoyed our cooking segment. 
for this recipe and other recipes, as well as to try all of our Zenbee veggie snacks, head to zenbee.com. Enjoy your veggie crostini. Cheers. Thank you again to our participants tonight and to everyone who has joined us from all over the world for this program. We hope you enjoyed it. If you have a moment, please fill out a short survey about this program. You can find the link in the description as well as in the chat. We appreciate your feedback and hope to see you again at future Japan Society programs. Thank you and good night.